Welcome to another episode of our Personal Empowerment Premium Audio Series, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is about that kind of thinking we do, that binary thinking where we're all stressed, that black or white, that right or wrong, that good or bad, that friend or foe, the kind of thinking that leads to like there being only one right answer. And we call it the either or mentality. This used to frustrate me enormously when I was first doing radio programs. Actually, it frustrated me later, also years into the process, but I became more intrigued with it than frustrated by it. And it's still fascinating to me. There is something dual about living in the world. Maybe it's the fact that there's two genders, masculine and feminine. Maybe the binary nature of the brain, you know, you got a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere that in many ways are pretty independent. Of course, you got two eyes and two ears, two nostrils, two arms, two legs. I mean, it's very easy to begin to think in terms of this or that, as if all differences then are opposites. And that sort of leads to a belief in absolutes over the relative nature of things. It's all related to what we call binary thinking or the either-or mentality. And while there is, you know, definitely some validity to bifurcation, dividing things into two, it's a good approach to problem solving. To be limited by it is really disastrous. And yet many people are because they've just never heard anybody talk about the topic we're going to cover today. So what are the benefits and advantages of looking at things in terms of polarities, this or that, right or wrong, good or bad, winners or losers? And what do we do when we find ourselves trapped by that kind of binary thinking? And we often do find ourselves trapped by that kind of thinking because, you see, it's the fastest kind of thinking we can do. And therefore, when we're in survival or we think we're in a survival situation. Perhaps it's not really dangerous. We're just confused. But when we're in that kind of thinking situation, we move into this black or white, either or mentality, this this kind of looking at everything as either friend or foe or survival oriented or not survival oriented. And there's really no time in that kind of thinking to look at the rainbow of options between the black and the white. It's slamming the brakes or turn the wheel. You know, there's really no time to think about any other options. So it's kind of like whenever we're in that place, it's to do it or not do it. It's not look at some new way to do. And that's the disaster of that kind of black or white thinking. Because what happens is when people feel stressed like that and they move into that right or wrong, either or mentality, they do two things that really wreck it for all the rest of us. They make bad decisions and careless mistakes. And those are really two things that, you know, lead to, well, war, divorce, lawsuits, fistfights, road rage. I mean, you know, most every bad thing except natural disasters are caused by stressed out people who really don't look before they leap, don't think before they speak, don't take that moment to explore, are there any other options besides, you know, like these two? Is is it all-out war or surrender? You know, I mean, there's there's other options in between all-out war and total surrender. We have to look at that. The more stressed we are, the less likely we are to automatically do so. So that's one of the coolest things about the human mind is if you train it, It can remember in those critical moments to take one deep breath, enough time to take a break away from that automatic pilot response or reaction, one deep breath, and then we move into the ability to choose, and we can choose to do what we did last time, but we can also choose to look at options. What can we do different? Sometimes if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it makes sense. But sometimes if it ain't broke, but it's been like that way for a long time and it could be a whole lot better, then break the damn thing and reinvent it. Sometimes just because it works doesn't mean it's the best right answer. Sometimes there are better right answers. I'm going to date myself with this, but going back to the 60s, I remember a real irritating slogan from the right was, love it or leave it. America, love it or leave it. And then the left came back with change it or lose it, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Mm-hmm. But that's actually a pretty good response. Love it or leave it, of course, implies that you love their version exactly. of what it is. And it's a clever talking point, and it's still used today. You'll sometimes hear people say about the controversy over the 
war in Iraq, for example. Oh, you'd rather Saddam Hussein was still in power? No, I'd rather you found a different way of influencing world policy. I'd rather the million people that died still be alive. But do you see the appeal of that kind of argument? You immediately go, oh, uh, uh, and you're trapped rhetorically by a statement like that. So when you feel that feeling, if you're in a discussion with somebody and they use these kinds of tricky talking points, remember there are options. There's a middle between either or. The pendulum swings not only from this extreme to that extreme, but on the way, there's all these matters of degree. The swing of the pendulum shows us the permutations and the variations and the combinations between all this or all that. And I think that's a good way to use it. Those are the words I keep in my mind. I guess iteration would be another good word for it. Combination, variation, permutation, iteration, they're all Asians. <laughs> they're all options. There's, wait a minute, there's something between this and that. I mean, this leads to this other idea we touched on, that everything tends to be absolute to a binary thinker. Or perhaps we could say binary thinking, this either-or mentality, comes out of believing in absolutes, that there ought to be something that is 100% making everything else zero and irrelevant. In fact, there are no absolutes, at least in the world. Philosophers and people who study these matters say, well, maybe you could say the spiritual dimension is absolute. Sometimes philosophers use the word absolute in place of God or divinity or creator or source. But in the world, things are relatively true. Until you can explain exactly at what point fast becomes slow or when big becomes small, you're stuck with the fact that you live in a relative world. And truth is a matter of degree. And that's scary to people. So, Maybe the ultimate either-or, as Steve said, fight or flight, really comes back to the model we discuss so often, fear and love. Is it fear or is it love? Well, it's almost always a blend of, yeah, I'm a little cautious, I'm a little nervous, I'm worried about this, I'm concerned about that, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really frightened about this possibility over here, versus love or Said another way, ignorance and understanding, they have a relationship as well. So let's take a look today at the so-called middle way, that full swing of the pendulum, the rainbows, I could say the gray in between black and white, but how about the rainbows of possibility between everything and nothing? Probably two of the most uncomfortable conversations or kinds of conversations I've had in my life are around this black or white kind of thinking. I remember starting in the 60s. I, I've never been a big fan of war. I don't really like, I don't think, any war we've ever had, but starting with Vietnam particularly, I remember hearing if you're not for the war, then you're automatically a traitor and you're against the troops. Like, you know, you, you gotta, if you're against the war, you gotta be against the troops too, you know. I'm not, I'm against the orders the troops received, perhaps, but I was never against the people that, you know. So it's like, if you're not for us, you're against us, and you're literally bad, wrong, terrible, evil if you don't believe, you know, in America and its war that it's fighting. That that kind of black and white thinking, like, really disturbed me. And then the other, the other area, and you hear it now and then, you know, I try and stay out of these conversations, but people who tell me if I don't have their particular religious belief, if, I, if for example, I don't accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, I'm going to go to hell, period, end of statement. There's no room for any discussion about it. That, I'm sorry, that that's difficult for me. I don't know what to do with a conversation like that. I mean, it, there's no there's no conversation to have. So that kind of thinking that I'm right, everything else is wrong, this is the only way you can look at it kind of thinking is disturbing, it's irritating. I think it lacks wisdom, something that hasn't been explored in it. There's, as you said, Michael, there's nothing really that is that 
cut and dry that black and white. I mean, there are facts. Like, the Earth revolves around the sun, you know, but there's much more to the story than that, you know. Even a matter of degree, though. It's <laughs> yeah. part way around. Exactly. So some some statements are, like, sort of true and sort of not true. Like, I understand women, you know, it's sort of true and sort of not true. There's got to be some room for that variation. And what, what's real clear to me is that those people who move into that black or white kind of thinking, it's because of fear. You know, love love expands the way we think. Love makes us look at other possibilities because we feel safe to. But fear makes us unsafe and afraid to look at anything else. So we cling tenaciously to that one belief that we have, and it's got to be true because if it falls apart, everything else falls apart. And that's a very, very, like, scary way to live. I think whether it's religion or politics or some people are that way about particular child-rearing philosophies, and some people are that way about uh, the way lawyers behave. You know, there's lots of areas in our lives where we think that, you know, it's good or bad. I remember the difference between a criminal lawyer and a criminal lawyer, you know, <laughs> that, you know, that's, there's a big difference there. You know, there are lots and lots of rainbows in between the black and the white in every area of our lives. And if you find yourself in that kind of closed-minded black or white kind of thinking, you got to take a deep breath and step back because there's always choices. And that's the greatest thing about being human. There are always choices. I remember when I first started at uh, ABC Radio in Los Angeles in the late 70s doing a late-night talk show on the FM side, KLOS. And this older gentleman who was sort of mentoring me, I was still in my 20s at the time, he pulled me aside one night and he said, not religion or politics. You're going to want to stay away from religion and politics. And I said, well, Bill, if, if we avoid religion and politics, what do we have to talk about? Those are the best <laughs> talk show topics of all. Cooking and sports, I think, is all that's left. You know? I think the reason people tend to be real either-or thinkers, binary thinkers, in those two areas is that they're so emotionally based. And uh, sometimes we have a problem being reasonable about religion and politics because the emotions have such a strong pull or such a strong drive. In other words, why would somebody in any religion need you to accept their religion as absolutely true to the exclusion of all others? so that all the other religions are absolutely untrue because it's emotionally based. Because and you know what's even, even more amazing than that is not only other religions are wrong, but what's even wronger is no religion. Like 9%, I said the other day, 9% of the people wouldn't vote for somebody for president because they're Jewish. 49% wouldn't, wouldn't vote because they're atheist. It's the biggest prejudice of all. It, even any religion is, like, other religions are wrong, but they're at least okay. No religion, that's not okay no matter what. That's a real good point, and I think that's because it's a belief that if you're going to have morals or ethics, they have to be driven by religion, which is not true. Uh, humanism is certainly a philosophy that has very strong principles, morals, values, and ethics and yet humanism is not a religion. Humanism is often a point of view that's adopted by people for whom religion really doesn't work. Maybe they have a little sense of spirituality, a, a tenderness in their heart, a, a longing to believe things are connected or orderly somehow, but they just don't have enough facts to work with. So they call themselves humanists or Sometimes atheists, or ag they'll say they're, they're agnostic, I just don't know. But that doesn't mean they don't have value. I know. Your wife was telling me this morning, she heard, I think, on Bill Maher, somebody said an atheist is just a different kind of religion. I'm thinking that's, that's like saying not collecting coins is a hobby. You know what I mean? That's absurd. You know? So, so this, this bifurcating kind of thinking, you're either, you're, you're, your religion is right, and if you're an atheist, you have a religion that is wrong, that, that kind of thinking. Like there's no room in the middle in, in when thinking is fear-based. And that makes a whole lot of sense. When you realize what fear-based thinking does is it moves us away from what we don't want. It just, it just pushes. It doesn't really matter which way we go. It doesn't matter what. It's just as long as it's away from what we don't want. And, and that kind of thing pushes everything away. So if we sl slow down and we 
you know, quiet our mind so we can hear that love bass voice, which is always there. It just whispers. And when your fear bass voice is yelling, you don't hear it very much. But when you relax and slow down and listen to that love bass voice, well, that, that voice isn't pushing you away from what you don't want. It's drawing you toward what you do want with the realization that it doesn't really matter if you get there. What matters is that you go there, that it's the journey, not the destination. That's moving toward what you want is the best journey you could have because it's got the best lessons on the way and meets the best people along the way. And and so when there's a, a love-based focus and you're moving toward what you want, there's lots of options. There's, I mean, it's not one, you know, like sometimes this this little, you know, journey on this little side road is a good idea. And sometimes this little view stop and this little special way of taking this extra little step. Sometimes it's not the, the best way to some place isn't necessarily a straight line. Whereas when you're Fear-based, it's sort of a straight line away from. When you're love-based, it's all kinds of choices, all kinds of options as you move toward the thing you want the most. Isn't that important between running away from what you don't want and running toward what you do want? (laughs) Those are really not opposites. In a sense, you can say they're complementary, but they're not mere opposites of each other. These are really wonderful concepts There can be a definite advantage in approaching solving a problem with bifurcation. Let's divide it in two. And sometimes it applies. Hey, are you coming with us or are you staying behind? Are you ready to go or not? You know, are you with us or against us? Uh, Sometimes that'll work, but often you find in the real world these in-between situations. And Our argument is that having many choices is almost always better than having just a single choice. That's not really even a choice if you have just a single choice. (laughs) Well, we're richer by diversity, I guess is what I'm saying. Let's go back to religion. Let's stay with this idea. There's a famous uh, Hindu writer and speaker from the late 19th century— Swami Vivekananda wrote a book called Raja Yoga about the nature of enlightenment back in the 1800s. And he spoke in Chicago in 1893 at the World Parliament of Religions and blew people away because most Christians and Jews in America had never really heard an intelligent, well-educated Hindu speaker. Hinduism was always portrayed in the U.S. and in many ways still is, as some kind of uh, pagan, polytheistic, uh, unsophisticated uh, religion. Actually, it's Brahmanism. It's a very ancient set of religions. It's not one but thousands of belief systems that Westerners collectively call Hinduism. But Vivekananda spoke directly to this idea. He said, can you imagine a Christian or a Jew becoming a Hindu? Perish the thought, said this great Hindu teacher. But of course, he continues. So, God forbid the idea of a Hindu becoming a Christian or a Jew. Why would we want that? Why would you want your religion to dominate and extinguish all other religions especially since you know so little about all these other religions. Wouldn't you want to study them? Wouldn't you want to expose your children to all the basic religions? Why wouldn't a Christian want to know more about its roots in Judaism, about the relationship of Islam to Judeo-Christian ethics and beliefs, about the nature of so-called Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism, Jainism, Sikhism, wouldn't that enrich your worldview? Wouldn't that inform your particular religion and, and help you understand the depth and breadth of your spiritual beliefs? Well, of course, says the mind, but deeper in your body, down toward the bottom of the spine at the base, you seem to have this fear sitting there that says, no, no, I'm afraid to know that information. And I think that's why religion, and in the same way politics, is so fear-driven for many people, emotionally driven, but again, not a passion, because if it was love, it'd say, yeah, 
I love my particular religion or my political view, and I have such a love for it and such a tolerance of you having that same opportunity to love your different view that I'm going to be patient and tolerant and appreciate your take on things. (laughs) But no, if you're hostile, if you're fear-based, then you're going to be threatened by anything that's different. So check it out. What parts of your life frighten you? Do your belief systems rest upon ideas that you understand so little that you're threatened by anybody who disagrees? If you really were confident, somebody ought to be able to rave about religion or politics, and you could completely disagree and yet remain calm and reasonable. The very fact that people get angry ought to demonstrate to you that they're being motivated by fear. And you could take advantage of that if you're really calm and if you really felt like taking advantage of that. Or you could help somebody calm down say, hey, I, you know, this isn't really all that threatening, the fact that I disagree with you. Why don't you breathe and relax? Sometimes if I hear somebody really getting upset and yelling, getting angry, getting very defensive, I'm just thinking this person is using fewer brain cells, fewer brain cells, even fewer brain cells as their voice goes higher and they start yelling to make their point as if the only reason you disagree is you didn't hear them clearly. So now they're going to yell to make sure you understand and It's just absurd, and yet, isn't this the behavior we see in many people? Well, when you see it in yourself, that's when you really want to be concerned. Take a breath, relax, and ask yourself, what am I afraid of? That I'm not opening myself to the full range of ideas, all the options and variations. How can I become loving in terms of Steve said the word, it's wisdom. It's not finding the truth or the one right answer. Wisdom is looking at the diversity as if it enriches you, as if you're better for keeping an open mind. I think that's a good way to talk about it. I've actually heard very conservative, ultra-conservative people say an open mind is a bad thing. An open mind leaves room for evil influences. Well, I think you might want to look carefully at that which would seem to be evil. Isn't that something you'd really want to understand and have an open mind about? I really wish there was more discussion and conversation of this in early education so that, I guess, not in a political sense is this a liberal idea, but in terms of education, a liberal arts education is about embracing diversity, knowing that's part of a good education. Yeah, one of the real failings of our educational system is we don't teach people about relationships. We don't teach about communication or getting along with each other. And, you know, when you're in a relationship and and you have, you know, something special between the two of you, you you get vulnerable. You know, you get more able to be wounded and your buttons get shinier and all. And, And so what happens is we get in a relationship and we are frightened of losing the relationship. We're frightened of losing the respect the person feels for us or the admiration that we see in their eyes or we get terrified of losing that. So we think if we like lose the argument or lose the fight or whatever, then we'll be less in their eyes. And so we can't risk losing. And so all of a sudden it's like almost a survival thing. And what happens is we, we get like hyper logical and with hyper logical, you know, you, you need to be right and you need to win under all circumstances. Circumstances and compassion and empathy go right out the window. There's just no, you know, it's not like you're even thinking about how the other person's feeling. It doesn't really matter how the, it's not even concern of yours. All that matters is that you got to not lose because if you lose, then you lose respect or you lose dignity or you lose the relationship, whatever you, you that kind of thinking, like, again, all we need to do is move away from what we don't want. What I don't want is to lose his relationship. So I don't care which direction I go, as long as it's away from that, that's not going to help a relationship grow. That's where it's so important in a relationship to stop 
the escalation of these arguments and just take a deep breath and realize that sometimes, oftentimes, it's like more important that the relationship wins even if you lose the argument. You know, like this argument's not worth our relationship. It's not, it's like, it's just a issue. It's just a point. It's not even about what we're arguing about. It's usually about the fear of being wrong, not even about the subject or argument. Recognizing that, stepping back and saying, I'm not really in any danger here. I mean, you know, this is just a, this is a conversation that I'm so terrified uh, that I'm going to look bad in that I turn it into this huge fight, this huge argument. So this is the kind of place where either or thinking takes place. It doesn't have to be war. It can just be marriage. You know, I mean, any place where you're afraid of losing, you know, then you can move into that needing to win. And when you need to win at the expense of understanding the other person's place, the other person's perspective, the other person's point of view, then everybody loses. Yeah, conflict, adversity is real similar to diversity. It's the negative result of not being able to tolerate or not being willing to tolerate diversity. And yet, that's where real strength comes from. If you look at the environment or the ecosystem, you've got a beautiful example of, you could call it a paradox between unity and diversity. That the two are, again, not opposites. They're more like two sides of the same coin. That unity depends upon diversity. You go, wait a minute, that's contradictory. No, maybe a little paradoxical, but they're not contradictory. A diverse gene pool, for example, I think you probably remember the kid on the porch in Deliverance. He was a good banjo player, but he had that odd inbred look. And we see it in the royalty of Europe in past centuries where they just became too inbred. And not only did it degrade their intelligence, it created these serious physical health problems. Hemophilia came from that kind of thing I think it did, yeah. And a number of other problems as a result of, again, I guess you got to call it inbreeding. But the flip side of that then is you can see that a good, rich, diverse gene pool is necessary for good health. Well, in the same way, we have that in the environment. One of the concerns that we have about losing increasing numbers of species of animals and plants is that the integrity of the whole system begins to crumble. Bucky Fuller used to say it's sort of like losing rivets in an airplane. You're flying along and pop, there goes a rivet, and then pop, there goes another one, and that's okay. You're still flying along. The airplane's maintaining its structural integrity just because it's missing a few rivets, you know. They've become extinct in a sense, and then pop, 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 a couple of more rivets come out, and now that airplane's in danger of coming apart and dropping you to the ground. Well, that's what we're facing on Earth. If the diversity of the ecosystem, all of the different plants and animals and the symbiotic interdependent roles that they play, as that begins to degrade as a result of environmental poisoning and the extinction of certain species, then there could be this critical point where the whole thing falls apart. And you say, well, there's no oxygen to breathe. Why? Well, there's not enough trees and and green plants to generate the oxygen. Where are you going to get the air? You can't go to the air store or have air delivered to your house. Some some people buy it in bottles (laughs) if the medical condition requires it. But, you know, and clean water, the same thing. We live in a closed system Spaceship Earth is what Bucky Fuller used to call it, and that's a very important concept. Well, just as this is true in reproduction and the evolution of the human species, this inbreeding we talked about, in the larger system here, the environment or the ecosystem, the life support system on the planet, it's also true intellectually in terms of exposing yourself to a wide range of possibilities. And so, 
One of the concepts that we need to talk about in binary thinking is this biased belief that many people have that the first right answer they encounter is the best right answer because it's the only right answer. Now, where in the world would we get an idea that there's only one right answer? From school, from teaching to the test. You either get it right or you got it wrong. Now, if you ever had a teacher that was more interested in how you got to the answer, the process that you went through, you were in a good school system with a good teacher, but most teachers are so overworked and classrooms so overcrowded, there's no time to pay attention to how did you arrive at that answer. I just want to know, is it a right answer or is it a wrong answer? And so we come out of school into the real world looking for the one right answer, meaning anything else. Regardless of the approach, we're not even looking at the process. Any other answer must be wrong, and it's just not true. The real world doesn't work that way. I like the fact that you disagree with me. I can learn from that. It informs my position. I like the fact that we have various religions and philosophies, different kinds of food. I wouldn't want to go to the same Chinese restaurant every day. I love Chinese food, but I like a little Italian once in a while, or I want to head off to the Jewish deli or the Greek restaurant every once in a while. And so it is with music and custom and dress and the finer points of culture. It's so important as the world learns to get along and recognize all of humanity as a single family that we at the same time balance it with a respect for self-determination and sovereignty and the importance of diversity to develop, really, and embrace the rainbows between either or. Yeah, you know, we come out of that school with that only one right answer kind of thinking, and we move into the business world, and however it's done, that must be the way it's done, and, and so we just accept that without looking at better ways to do it. It's those rare individuals that, you know, say, if it ain't broke, let's break it, you know, it, it, just because it's working doesn't mean this is the best way to do it. You know, we've got new inventions, new innovations, new ways of thinking about things. Let's, let's rethink the way we do things. Like I was working with a, a company uh, a few months ago that is in the produce business, shipping produce all over the place. And, you know, up until about 10 years ago, what you'd do is you'd put all the produce in a cardboard box and you'd send it to the place and they'd take the, car, the produce out of the box and rip up the box and throw it away. Now they take the box and they send it back and they use it over and over and over and over again because now we understand that, you know, there's only so many trees and... And, and it makes more sense financially and, and, and environmentally. And, and it also makes people feel better, you know, that they're not destroying the environment. We can rethink the way we do the most basic things, you know, and, and change the company. And if we don't, well, what happened, for example, to Eastman Kodak? They didn't change. They didn't really go digital fast enough. They didn't really change the way they were thinking fast enough. And now they're Chapter 11, you know, one of the most venerable companies of our day, you know. It's not okay to keep going the way you've been going necessarily. Sometimes if it isn't broken, you still have to break it. You still have to take a look at a new way to do this thing. We're, we've left the assembly line age. We've left the computer age. I don't even know what this new age is, but it's a very, very different time, and, and we have to rethink everything that we're doing. And so one of the most basic ways of doing that is to get out of that either-or mentality, which is it's either the way it is or there's no other option, and start to look at Choices, you know, that's so powerful. Choices, we always have choices, and and we even have more choices than the first peers we have. So that's that's what it takes. And to get out of that black or white kind of thinking, move away from that fear based thinking into the love based thinking, and all of a sudden the voices are full of choices. Steve said a few minutes ago that breath was one of the keys, a slow, deep breath, and I want to emphasize that as we move toward our audio journey and some relaxation and reflection upon this whole idea of busting up binary thinking with a more creative approach to options. 
uh, people sometimes talk about, well, when you're really frightened or angry or emotionally worked up, count to 10. Well, if you're going to do that, I'd suggest you count backwards 10 to 1 because there's too much anticipation and the number's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and now I'm still angry, even more angry. If you're going to count, count down. Slower, more relaxed, deeper, uh, sort of deflating the situation. But I think rather than rely on the brain to interrupt itself, if you remember to breathe, there's just something about uh, that slow, deep breath, particularly the exhaling side of it where you let go. Uh, that deflates not only your lungs, but that belief that it's everything or nothing. And that anybody who disagrees with you, even just a little bit, is your enemy, right? This happens in marriage. You agree on 99% of things, and yet here comes this one area where you might rub each other wrong a little bit, Got a little friction point going on. Disagree for any number of reasons in this one little tiny area, less than 1% of your worldview, and yet you get into it and all of a sudden you feel as if this person that you love so completely is opposite. No, they're on your team. They're on your side. You're working together in virtually every area. And then, all of a sudden, the emotion says, that's not true. This person is out to get you. They're a threat. They're the enemy. And you need to eliminate them. Well, what is that? Physiologically, it's a battle between different areas in the brain, between this really core reptilian brain and the neocortex. There's a mammalian brain in there also that represents the evolution of the brain. But we have this wonderfully developed frontal lobe and this cortex that is reasonable and says, wait a minute, not everything is true or false. Didn't we have some multiple choice? Didn't I have one, two, and then a third possibility? And then Maybe D, a fourth option, and maybe even none of the above or all of the above, or I really like the essays. Now I can really express myself. We have a short little essay. We call them blue books in colleges where you could write out how you really felt. So beyond either or, true or false, is multiple choice. And beyond multiple choice the richness of diversity in all things, even if they are emotionally driven. Use your breath. Uh, create and sense a feeling of relaxation, and you get smarter. Not only do you become more calm emotionally, feeling safer and more relaxed, you really do get smarter. You have more choices. You have more options. Isn't that a good definition of being really, really smart? So if you believe there's only one right answer and all differences are wrong, you've just defined ignorance, right? Even if you have a right answer, it doesn't mean it'll always be the right answer. A better answer can come along. We're seeing that now in personal transportation. Do we really want to stay with the internal combustion engine that poisons the air and the water, that causes us to export our national treasure to foreign nations and generate all kinds of wars to get this poison to run our automobiles and pollute the environment? It's just insane. Okay, good idea in 1900, but... Now it's 115 years later, maybe we could begin to think of alternative ways of getting around. And so the electric car is born, and we're looking at better batteries and better sources of energy. So we need to be creative in this sense, and I think that's a good word for it. Breathing, relaxation, stimulates creativity, allows you to see the rainbow of options. Again, 
variations, permutations, combinations, and iterations. That's a good thing. That makes you a whole lot smarter. Speaking of getting a whole lot smarter, that always happens as you get out of stress and move into feeling safe. You know, when you're feeling stressed, your brain is very clear that strong and fast is more important than smart. Fight or flight is more important than thinking things out. But when you relax and you know you're not in danger, you know you're safe. There's no need for that superhuman strength or superhuman speed. And so you can get better and smarter and and your mind can get wiser as well. So it starts with uh, closing your eyes, letting your brain know you're safe because if you're eyes are closed, there must be nothing dangerous coming at you, and taking a deep breath, that sigh of relief kind of uh, breath, that uh, a couple few of those deep breaths, and let your brain know even more clearly that you're safe. And then, of course, to add a cherry on top, imagine yourself in a place where you would be safe, uh, an imaginary or memory place, a safe and peaceful place, a, a tranquil place that feels really nice and You know, here we call it paradise. So relax, release, feel the peace of paradise. Imagine the process of relaxation continuing for another minute or two. You could think of yourself as walking downstairs, or you could ride an escalator if you'd like. Just feel the feeling of going deeper and becoming more and more relaxed. Take another slow, deep breath or two, and after pulling in strength and power on the inhalation, Feel a letting go ah, as you relax. That sigh of relief is a release of anxiety and stress and tension that generates even more fear and more confusion. And more fear and more confusion, you can let that go and become more creative. More peaceful and more loving means more understanding, more choices, and more options. Consider that polarities are not opposites. The North Pole and South Pole of a bar magnet or the planet Earth, for that matter, are opposites in a sense, semantically, in terms of the words we use. We could think of the North Pole, magnetically, and South Pole, as so completely different as to be in opposition. But in fact, complementary would be a better term. Each is part of a whole that is a magnetic field that embraces the entire planet Earth that is found around a bar magnet or any conductor of energy, any wire with electrical current moving along it has this magnetic field around it. It has its polarities, its positive and its negative, and yet you could not have one electrical charge without the presence of the other. Even matter itself is thought to be particles that in some cases are attracted and in other cases electrically repelled. It's a good thing. It holds things together. So, which is the good polarity and which is the bad polarity? Is the North Pole the right one and the South Pole, electrically, the wrong one? Well, of course not. And so we need to adjust our thinking. Sometimes differences are opposites. Sometimes they're complementary. 
the way your left hand can interlace with the right hand and fit so perfectly, and yet they're completely opposite. My left hand has the thumb on the left side. My right hand, the fingers are in a completely different order with the thumb on the right side. Is one the good hand, the other a bad hand? Is one hand right and the orientation of the other hand wrong? Is that what we mean by on the other hand? Now feel how that informs your ability to understand. And as you relax... It's clear that it's not just right or wrong. It's not either or. It's not weak or strong. It's not black or white. It's not true or false. When you relax, you see, there are choices. And all the voices offer other choices. More choices than you ever knew you possessed. And it's not as if there's only one right choice, another might be better or better or best. So, out of stress, it becomes real clear as you move toward love and not influenced by fear that more and more choices appear. And with every breath that you release and every time you embrace the peace, The black or white, the either or, it goes away. Not there no more. What's there now, very clear, full of love, free of fear, is lots of choices. And more choices that you can see. The more you relax, the more choices come to be. So whenever you're feeling compelled to win or... There's an argument that's just about to begin, then take one slow, deep breath, and you'll find that the part of your mind that prefers to be kind will unwind your mind, and you'll find choices, lots of voices, all of them offering a lot of choices. Relax and find inside your mind the voices that offer alternative choices. There's a beautiful story from Eastern philosophy about the lute player, the guitar teacher, telling his student that If the string is too tight, it'll break. If it's too loose, it will not play. And from this arises the concept of the middle way. Sometimes called the third way, it actually opens up a fourth, a fifth, a sixth option, a seventh alternative, an eighth way of looking at things, permutations and variations. It starts with that magic of three. If you can find a middle, you can find the 60-40 and the 70-30 and the 85-15, the whole playing field, the gridiron between the end zones. All relative, a matter of degree, somewhat this way, a little bit of that way, tending toward this, but including that. This is an integrated part of understanding, of seeking understanding, of embracing full and complete understanding, and even then being open to a greater understanding, recognizing understanding as superior to being right. 
The problem with needing to be right is that even if you are right now, situations change. And that rightness may not last. There may be a better right for you, for everyone else, evolving out of what had been right, a better way, evolving and growing. Open yourself to that kind of mental and emotional flexibility. Start with the safety of returning to this paradise, this place of peace on a daily basis to reorient yourself, to see not only the opposites, but the infinite variations and degrees of truth between the poles. So in paradise, you can plainly see the lack in the either-or, in the white and black. Now, there's so many options, so many choices to choose. And a relaxed mind is a wise mind and a tool that you can use. So with that thought in mind of lots of choices, with each deep breath that you take, more choices and more choices... And it's okay to make a mistake. Allow yourself the freedom to see beyond the black and white. Allow yourself the freedom to see beyond wrong and right. And as it feels comfortable for you, take a deep breath, orient yourself to the room, open your eyes, and come back to wide awake from this focused passion state of narrow awake back to the state of wide awake. Not only do lots of answers and lots of choices make you feel safe, it's interesting that feeling safe, deliberately, consciously choosing, proactively to feel safe and relaxed, promotes understanding. And it's a wonderful, gentle, upward spiral. Open your mind. Be open-minded. Always look for better ways and lots of choices and options. And remember that people who disagree with you enrich and inform your understanding make life much more wonderful remember we're all unique just like everybody else that's exactly right thanks for being with us join us next week as we continue with our premium audio personal empowerment series finding yourself in paradise be gentle love life and take care of each other for steve snyder this is michael benner aloha from maui